Okay, uh, hello everybody, uh, welcome back. My name is Isabela kotyńska zielińska I'm a coordinator of the I Live by the Sea uh, project. Today we have next webinar of the I Live by the Sea summer school. Uh, school is organized by today we have IOPAN and Gdynia Aquarium. Uh, today we have Agata Skomar and Monika Wiśniewska, who are marine uh, biologists and marine educators in Gdynia Aquarium. Uh, all the housekeeping rules are repeated in the chat box. Um, Agata and Monika, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so my name is Monika and I will start with you. We will speak about authentic habitats. Now I will show you our presentation. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so today we will speak about Baltic Sea bottom, and uh, at the end we will try to uh, decide if it is true or a myth that Baltic, uh, bottom, the Baltic Sea bottom is a, a desert. In our classes in Gdynia Aquarium, we try to teach according uh, to the ocean literacy politics. Uh, so also uh, today we choose a topic which is connected with ocean literacy politics. And as I said earlier, I will speak about benthic habitats and Agatha will focus on Baltic pollution. Uh, we should uh, start with an explanation what the bottom is. Uh, we can compare a sea bottom to the floor. Uh, this is a part of the earth crust covered by global, global ocean water. And the bottom is divided into a few parts depending on the location, depth and form. A Baltic Sea bottom includes coastal zone. This is the part closest to the shore. Plains uh, it looks like underwater table and deeps that are the deepest part of the sea. Now I've got question. What is the deepest spot in the Baltic Sea? So the deepest part uh, in the Baltic is the Landsorp Deep uh, that is located uh, in the West Central Baltic as a part of uh, Gotland Basin. Uh, it is an anoxic basin, so there is a total depletion of the level of oxygen and it is almost uh, 460 meter deep. What do you think? Uh, it is a really deep. Uh, for uh, compare, I put here uh, two uh, pictures. One is a blue whale and uh, the second is porpoise. The blue whale is our Marian Trench, a uh, Mariana Trench, I'm sorry. And uh, the second one, the porpoise, is uh, Lansort Deep. We see that blue whale is much more bigger than porpoise. And it's, uh, it is the same like in Mariana Trench and Lansor Deep. Mariana Trench is almost 24 times deeper than Lansor Deep and reaches the depth uh, close to 11 kilometers. So, uh, as you see, Baltic Sea isn't a deep sea. Uh, Benthic habitats cover about 70% of the Earth's surface and 98% of the marine species live on or in the ocean floor. The benthic zone maintains a substantial part uh, of the world biodiver biodiversity, uh, so we can agree with fifth principle of ocean literacy, saying that ocean supports great diversity of life and ecosystems. Uh, the organism related uh, with sea bottom are known as a benthos. Uh, it is the community of organisms that live on, in, or uh, near the seabed. And benthos is divided into zoo benthos that comprises animals and phytobenthos referring to plants. 
Pentos can also be divided based on its size and location. The smallest microscopic organisms that uh, are less than about 0.1 millimeter in size are called microbentos. Uh, Mayobentos are animals that are between 0.1 and 1 millimeter in size. And finally, the larger visible to naked, naked eye organism greater than 1 millimeter in size uh, are known as macrobentos. I, as a marine biologist, work mostly with microbentos, so I will, uh, I will present you a few species belonging to this fraction. Uh, now, uh, different kinds of bentos depending on the organism location in sediments. Some animals are burrowing in the sediment, often in the oxygenated top layer. They are endobentos. Uh, other animals prefer to live on top of the sediment. This is epibentos. And uh, we find also animals that live just above the sediment, and they are called hyperbentos. Zoobentos has an important role in marine environment. It's the major source of food to most dwelling fish. A benthic organism can also control the amount and kind of plankton, attached algae and aquatic plants, uh, because there is the source of their food. Their activities in sediments modulate exchanges of nutrients and toxins between sediments and overlaying water. Uh, sometimes they act as a shelter to other er organisms. Uh, for example, shrimps can hide in an anus of a sea cucumber, and some fishes lie their eggs in a clam mantle to provide them protection from predators. And some animals uh, like uh, clams, sea cucumber, shrimps, crabs, lobsters, and flatfishes are harvested for human, for human use. Uh, so, uh, sea can be covered by different kinds of sediments. It can be seared, sand, rocks, or it can be covered by plants. And the sediments can also coexist, creating a mixed medium. Depending on types of seabed, we will find different types of organisms. Animals that burrow in uh, sediments uh, choose place with soft, silt, and uh, sandy seabed. Between rocks, we will find small animals like uh, crabs, which are looking for a shelter there. And uh, plants are a good source of food or shelter. So, uh, silt, silty beds, uh, seabed is the finest sediment. In places covered by this kind of sediment live burrowed animals. Some of them build a houses that look like a tube, which are a mixture, mixture of mucus and slime. And uh, one of these species is Priapulus caudatus, which belongs to penis worms. It's a cylindrical, unsegmented worm, uh, which grows to a length of 15 centimeters. And uh, characteristic is uh, their mouth. Uh, the mouth is surrounded by seven rows, and each row uh, has five teeth. You can see this here. And the body is divided into two uh, distinct regions, ended by uh, tail-like appendages. So the first part, the front part, have rows and spines, and the back part uh, have um, ring-like uh, marking visible here. The next one is Hadista diversicolor or, uh, or ragworm. It's a polychaetworm which can withstand great variances in salinity. 
it lives in burrows in the sand format of beaches and estuaries. Uh, and its specific name, diversity color, refers to the fact that its color changes from brown to green as the breeding season approaches. And uh, ragworm can grow up to 10 centimeters in length and may have from 90 to 120 segments. Important that each segment has a pair of uh, bristly appendages known as parapods, which are used for walking and swimming. And uh, rockworm uh, has been used to evaluate the quality of marine sediment because it bioaccumulates certain heavy metals such as lead, cadmium, chromium, and arsenic. And uh, important is also uh, that information uh, that uh, ragworm is a predator and generally scavenger able to adapt its diet to whatever is currently available. The next one is Saduria entomon, my favorite. It is a isop isopod crustacean, which is considered as a glacial relict in the Baltic Sea. Uh, at the same time, this is the one of the largest Baltic crustacean. Uh, the largest one are found in the uh, depths of the Gulf of Botnia and reaching a maximum length uh, nearly to nine centimeters. Uh, Saduria lifespan is about three years, uh, then most individuals died after reproduction. And she is a predator that feeds on uh, other benthic animals. Uh, it's also a scavenger and a cannibal, and uh, it swims in usual way, upside down. And don't worry, uh, this species likes cold water, so we don't find it near it near the shore. Close to the shore uh, lives Corophium volutator. It's a small species of amphipod crustacean found in mud flats. Its body uh, is white with a brown marking. Uh, the head bears two parts of antennae. The first uh, are sm small and point forward, while the uh, second part is much larger and thicker. Important is that females have a broad, pro pa broad pouch or marsupium, which is located on the ventral side, right here. On the sandy uh, seabed, so we find uh, three species of bivalves laying or burrowing in sand. Uh, they have different shape and coloration, and all of them uh, have got soft body covered by calcareous shells. Uh, it's different to snails, which have one shell. Bivalve shells are built of two parts. They are filtrators and deposit feeders. Uh, the biggest is the sand gaper. Its shell is white and oval in shape. And uh, this is the dominant species of mollusk in our sea. Maybe uh, sometimes this period of the Baltic Sea history will be named after Mira Arenaria. Quite similar to Mira is Baltic clam, Limecola baltica. Uh, this is small animal that uh, have a more round shape of a half of the sh shell. And the second part is uh, have a visible corner. Uh, it can uh, have a white, pale, pink or orange color. And the most characteristic is the lagoon cockle. It looks like a heart and has a white corrugated shell. Here, you can see this. Crangon uh, crangor is a commercially important uh, species, species of shrimp fished mainly in the southern North Sea. Its common names include brown shrimp, common shrimp, bay shrimp, and sand shrimp. 
And in the Baltic Sea, adults are typically between three to five centimeters long. And uh, the animals have cryptic coloration, being a sandy brown color, which can be changed to match the environment. Uh, they uh, live in shallow waters and feed nocturnally. Uh, during the day, they remain buried in the sand to escape predatory birds and fish. Diastelis uh, species, Diastelis uh, ratkei, is a species of uh, crustacean which looks similar, rather like alien. And it's common in the Baltic Sea, uh, where the bar is itself into sandy bottom. It has a very characteristic body shape and grows up to 22 millimeters. Its body is composed of an oval flared cephalopod. This is this part. Uh, next, there are a few uh, free segments. And at the end is the thin abdominal terminating in a caudal plate uh, surrounded by uropodia. Uh, it, uh, this species is resistant to anaerobic condition and have to be present on ammonium compounds. The European flounder is a flat fish of European coastal waters. It normally grows about uh, 30 centimeters in length, and uh, the upper surface is usually dull brown or olive in color with a reddish spot and brown blotches. And uh, this fish can change color to suit its background, providing uh, an effective camouflage. And the underside is fairly white. Uh, flounder is uh, flattened laterally and swim and rest on one side, which you can see at the movie. And during development, its eyes usually migrate to the right side of the fish, as uh, what appears to be its upper surface is in really its right side. Uh, but in about 30% of indiv individuals, its eyes move to the left and uh, then the left side becomes the uppermost. Uh, on rocky seabeds, uh, we find sessile organisms like blue mussel and uh, bay barnacle, which spend all their lives attached to one place. Uh, the blue mussel, also known as a uh, common mussel, is a edible marine bivalve mollusk. Uh, blue mussels are subject to commercial use and uh, intensive aquaculture, but not in the Baltic Sea because uh, here their size is too small. Uh, the shells have specific dark color and uh, shape, and blue mussels are filter feeders and play a vital role in estuaries by removing bac bacteria and toxins. The by barnacle uh, is uh, only one sessile crustacean lives in Baltic Sea. Uh, it has a white or gray col con uh, conical calcareous shell composed of six fused plates. Uh, and uh, there is an opening uh, at the top, uh, which is uh, blocked by two plates. Adults usually grow to about one centimeter in diameter. And the bay barnacle is a filter feeder. It extends its six par of modified legs uh, called Siri to catch plankton and uh, other organic material planting paths. And uh, a bay barnacle uh, is a hermaphrodite and sperm is passed into the cavity of the neighboring barnacle throughout a long penis. And uh, its uh, penis is eight times longer than their body size. And here you can see this cilia, and here is a long penis.
In Baltic Sea uh, live uh, three species of uh, crabs. Uh, crabs are crustaceans that belong to decapods. It means that they have 10 legs. Important is that the first pair of legs in crabs is transformed into pincers, and the other four parts are used to move. Uh, also important is that crabs can move only sideways. Uh, their body is covered by a hard carapace, and only one European green crab occur naturally in the Baltic Sea. The other two are invasive species from North America and China. And uh, estuarine mud crab uh, can reach a maximum size of two centimeters. Uh, it has an olive green brownish color, sometimes with dark spots on its carapace. And uh, the bigger uh, Chinese meat and crabs uh, carapax is between 3 to 10 centimeters wide and uh, its legs are about twice as long as the carapace is wide. Uh, so together with legs, the wide uh, can be about 30 centimeters. It has a brown color and a fur on its uh, pincers. And uh, maybe Someday you will find a crab on the beach and you will try to recognize the species. So you can also try to uh, determine the sex of these uh, animals. I don't know if you see this crab. Maybe I will put it. Uh, Oh, okay, it's better. So uh, I've got two crabs, two dried uh, Chinese meat and crab, male and female. And if you want to determine the sex of these animals, it's really easy. Uh, at the first, we should know where is the abdomen on the dorsal on, or in the ventral side. So here is dorsal. Here is the ventral side, and here, like you see, is our abdomen. And uh, the abdomen in, in female is uh, really big and cover almost all ventral side because there is the place when uh, female attach the egg. So here you see female. The Abdomen in males has a shape of a triangle. Do you see the difference? I hope that yes. And maybe now we will try to determine the sex of this animal. It is female or male. Yes, this is male. And on a seabed covered by plants, uh, live small animals looking there a food or a shelter. And one of them is Gammarus. Uh, Gammarus is a small crustacean that has a specific reproductive behavior. Male are carrying a female, like you see in this picture. Gemmeras can also live inside the blue master colony or under the rocks. Uh, Idotea uh, is, uh, is a species closely collected, related to uh, plants. Its body is elongated and uh, has a few centimeters in length. And its body coloration is green or brown, similar to nervy plants. Uh, we've got four prawn species, and the most popular are common prawn and Baltic prawn. They are different in coloration. Chrom common prawn, uh, which is an invasive species, has a colored body uh, with uh, brown or, or white dots, and the uh, 
the legs are covered by blue and yellow stripes, and the Baltic brown is almost all uh, transparent. It has only a few brown dots on its body. And in this picture, we can uh, see also three different kinds of legs. The first part are the pincers. Next, the four parts uh, are the pereopods used to move. And here, just under the abdomen, uh, they are the peleopods uh, using to ventilate gears. On sandy and rocky seabed covered by plants, we can see small animals. They are a mud snail. Sometimes they cover almost all sea grass, and uh, there is a really big number of them in shallow waters. Uh, so this is all for me. I hope you enjoy last 20 minutes and uh, that I set information new for you. Now I pass the voice to Agatha. Uh, so, hello everyone again. Uh, this is uh, survey of the bottom uh, of the Baltic Sea. That has a very small other side. And the group subject of closure is the ethical of us. So, let's start by definition what pollution is. So, pollution, which means introduction into the marina environment of uh, substance or energy that fuels inter air harmful effects such as danger and harm to human health, life, and to the ecosystem. So I hope everyone, of course, understands what is uh, sea pollution. Uh, however, can we divide uh, pollution in groups or categories? Uh, of course, yes. Uh, here we have uh, six groups of um, pollution, types of pollution. Uh, we have biological substance, chemical returning garbage, uh, toxin substance, only nervous substance, and radioactive uh, uh, substance. But um, uh, but how does all this pollution uh, get into the Baltic Sea? Uh, a huge element of uh, pollution, which in um, form of uh, wastewater or by air, reaches the sea together with the rivers. Um, the largest amount of harmful substance is brought by the largest river um, of the southern and the, uh, eastern Baltic Sea. For example, the Oder, Vizla, Neman, and Neva. So, a conclusion is the pollution goes to the sea with the uh, river. Uh, as you can see, uh, and I said a moment ago, we have many types of pollution. But uh, today we will discuss um, of this, we will meet um, at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. So uh, now we focus on biological substance. Uh, let's think about what are the effects of biological substance pollution on the Baltic uh, Sea. Uh, most often during um, the summer, we can meet the process of, uh, of um, eutrophization, uh, which is a very important natural process in nature. However, an excess of bio, uh, biogenic salts can bring something else uh, that you will soon find out. Uh, but first, what eutrophization means. So it's a process uh, by which a body of water became enriched in dissolved nutrients, such as uh, phosphates, that stimulate the growth of aquatic plants like usually restrained in the de uh, depletion of this bullet oxygen. Uh, so now you know what is um, uh, the um, eutrophization. So let's see how the process of uh, eutrophization uh, goes if we have too many biological uh, substances. Large inflow of biological salt gets to the Baltic Sea, now you, you know, with rivers. If we have a lot of biological salts and sunlight, 
and phytoplankton blooms and macrograss must develop mass. If they have a lot of phytoplankton, we have increase of zooplankton biomass and a subsequent uh, links to the fruit chain. If we have a lot of flying organism, a uh, living organism, uh, then after uh, we will have a lot of dead organism. Uh, dead organism uh, matter falls on the bottom of uh, the tank. So, time times has to happen with um, this dead material. The decomposition of dead materia is handled by bacteria. During the decomposition process, uh, they use the available oxygen. And sometimes it happens that all oxygen is used up and the organic materials has not yet decomposed. So the, um, then there is still organic materia decomposition, but under um, anaerobic conditions. So during this process, when we have no oxygen and then the composition of organic material uh, continues, toxin, hydrogen uh, sulfate appears and the bottom macrofauna dies out. And then uh, the format hydrogen uh, sulfate deserts. So um, now we, and you know, um, what can happen if it's too much a uh, biological substance. And now uh, we have a difficult question because what uh, context aerotification and chemical uh, weaponry after World War II? So uh, after this war, uh, 50,000 tons of chemical weapons were sunk in the Baltic Sea. And they uh, sunk in a deep area with the large layer of steel where the anaerobic condition create by the erotification process provide. Um, anaerobic condition help to reduce both metal corrosion process and the possibility of connect with living organisms. However, uh, we in uh, an anaerobic environment, we can meet living organisms such as bacteria. So my next question is, what happens if a chemical weapon is released into the water? So when the substance remains in the water in anaerobic medium. So uh, today we don't talk uh, what happens that with this substance hit to the beach uh, because it's another history. Uh, but today we focus on the uh, bottom of Baltic Sea. So uh, this substance has a higher destiny than water, which means that they will remain of the bottom even if the tanks in which they were start coverage. So, for example, impaired or mustard gas released into the water remains on the bottom in solid form and will slowly uh, destiny. Impaired uh, eventually uh, decomposed uh, into no toxin substance, but uh, some intermediate products of this hydrolysis are toxin. Uh, second B, uh, decomposed uh, rapidly in sweet water and their um, degradation products are not toxic. So now you know what makes look like. Um, conclusion is substance stay uh, in this cause at the bottom. Uh, um, now we have very important uh, question. Uh, is the nature in safe elbow uh, to deal with such pollution? So maybe I'll discuss this with Ilgras and uh, Extate. So let's take a look at the bay, the uh, Putk Bay in uh, Poland. In 1950s, Ilgras uh, considered almost 90% of the area of the inner Putk Bay. Uh, the dramatic um, decline in coverage in the 1970s was caused by adverse environmental conditions. 
uh, in the following years, uh, this painting attempts uh, its range did not change. However, uh, over time, the environment coped with the difficult conditions and ill grass began to occur again in a large area uh, of the bay. So we have the example um, of the Puck Bay where you can see how ill grass has uh, been reborn. Uh, Besides human health, uh, nature managed to copy by itself. So nature copy with this. Uh, so, unfortunately, it's the end of my talk and our presentation. Uh, I uh, thank you very uh, much to listen to this, uh, I think, a little bit difficult uh, topic. So, uh, here is our email. So, if you have any question, write to us. Uh, and I think it's the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Agatha and Monika. It was a great pleasure to listen to you. And uh, we would like to invite you to the last webinar of the I Live by the Sea Summer School, uh, which will be held on 19 August at uh, free Central European time. Uh, the webinar will be hosted by Ned Dwyer, from the RNB consultants and the webinar title is The Ocean Keep Us Cold in a Warming World. So uh, thank you very much for this webinar and see you uh, next week. Thank you very thank much. You and bye bye. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. bye.